Hello, thank you all for coming to Climate Emergency and Resilience. And we can get right started since we're a little behind time. And um, I'll ask speakers, if possible, to speak about 12, 13 minutes so that we will have time at the end, approximately 15 minutes for questions. But if that's impossible for you to speak your full 15, feel free. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Althea Davis, Senior Lecturer in the School of Geography and Sustainable Development Center for Energy Ethics here at St. Andrews, who will be presenting on our presence of their past intergenerational heritage and adaptation in the climate extremes on the coast of northern Peru. Thank you very much. Are you if you heard the news today, then maybe it's a, um, a sort of sad um, connection that the IPCC are saying that they're talking about our, our diminishing window of opportunity to change our, our behavior and our policies to really ensure that we can reasonably stick within um, 1.5 degrees of warming. And that's entirely relevant to the, the case study, the work that I want to present to you today. Um, it's very much an interdisciplinary team um, effort, um, and you'll see that one of our latest speakers uh, in the session features as well. And um, so the North um, Peruvian coast is, is highly exposed to um, climate extremes, which are a source of wealth and vulnerability. So the El Nino southern oscillation is a major driver of world climate systems. It's a key part of the, the um, productivity of the oceans um, that underpin much of the, the Peruvian economy. So Peru is one of the top three um, most productive fisheries in the world. And that is in part due to the, the very rich um, ocean currents that, that come um, onto the, the shore. But this same sort of wealth also exposes them to climate extremes because the, the warming of ocean temperatures that occurs during a, um, an El Nino phase means that um, rather than these um, rich marine currents, actually they get deluged with um, high intensities of rainfall, which cause flooding, um, infrastructure damage, and an increased prevalence of waterborne diseases like malaria and cholera. So we can see from the, the maps on the right here that we can see that during an El Nino event, you get the, this um, in, in high, increase in um, ocean temperatures, particularly warm oceans, um, focusing on um, the, the eastern Pacific and particularly the coast of um, Ecuador on the, the north of Peru. And that translates in the middle at to um, vulnerability and high impact on land because of the, the intensified rainfall that happens. So from the uh, El Nino events in the 1980s um, and 90s, we saw a more than 10 times increase in the discharge of water from the river Pura in this area. That meant that the, the city of, of Pura and the wider region um, experienced an intense um, disruptions and damage. And although um, our monitoring and predictive capacity for these sort of quite extreme climate events is much improved, it remains very difficult to predict the exact timing, the duration, and intensity of specific El Nino events, um, which also vary very much from one event to the other. So, for instance, in 2015-16, there was predicted to be a major El Nino event in Zurich. But for, for this part of South America, it turned out to be very mild. But it was followed by an anomalous El Nino event, an El Nino Costo, which means a coastal El Nino, which you can see from, uh, well, you can probably <laughs> see behind the, 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 the video um, image in the bottom right corner, there was um, an El Nino that just focused, not, it wasn't a global event, it was very much a regional event. Um, and this caused intense flooding, and you can see the picture on the left there, some of the, the city flooding and standing out into rural areas um, around here. And although El Nino events are very difficult to predict, um, with climate warming, 
it's expected that they might be one and a half to two times more um, more frequent um, in the future, even if we stick to one and a half degrees um, warming. And you can understand that as a result of these sort of interacting factors with these climate infrastructure vulnerability, and the year is normally generated as a disaster. But that's far from the only way of seeing it, as we're increasingly <laughs> from some of our work. But it's a story that's very familiar to archaeologists. So if we look at the archaeological record, we can see that there are examples of um, irrigation canals and flood water fields that were adapted to take the excess flood water that happened during the extreme events. And some of the sediments in um, inland lagoons that, that dry normally um, are from the fish. So we can see archaeological sites where fish was a really important part um, of their adaptive um, strategy um, during our major events. But that isn't the message that you see if you look at modern representations of El Nino. <laughs> so, so this led to lots of the work that, that we've been doing, led by my colleague uh, Nina Laurie over the last few years. And I put on screen this quote from her that how she first learned by speaking to a local mayor that this isn't just a disaster story for many of the communities, specifically in the desert. So they don't, they're not the ones with the direct access to the marine productivity. So these desert communities don't see our union necessarily as a disaster or a crisis. They see it as one of opportunity because the rainfall 